Thanks, Wanda. Uh, good morning. Before we really get started into what we want to talk to you about uh, this morning, we're going to watch a short video about missions in Belgium. To understand Belgium, it's not always so easy. One of the things that I found um, difficult in raising support to come to Belgium is that many people don't understand from New Zealand the cultural background or the spiritual background of, of a country like Belgium. Europe has a uh, Christian heritage, but also we always talk about Europe and of course Belgium is part of it, as post-Christian era. You, you don't find this back home so often that the, basically the culture is Christian but non-believers. A very, very high percent of the Belgians don't believe in God anymore. They think it's old-fashioned. And when you look at the numbers, they are some of the most unreached people um, around. The evangelicals in Belgium are, are really only um, 1.4-1.5 percent and that's that's all the Christians. If, if you really take just the Belgians you'd be around a half percent only. They are from uh, the Netherlands or other countries immigrated here so I don't know how many real Belgium indigenous Belgian people are actually Christians. I mean there is numbers of less than one percent out there. Less than one percent of all Belgians are evangelical Christians. And if you compare that to the Muslim uh, population in Belgium, which is around six percent, it's a, a, huge, uh, a huge shock for, for many people. And, and some of the cities like, like Brussels, um, they, they're way larger. You're talking there possibly 20-25%. We have a million Muslims in Belgium who are active. So they're more active in Belgium than Christians. There is a history of church, but it's been lost or perhaps we never pr properly understood. And if you look at Europe, I mean, that's really the story, that mm. there's no clean slate. There is an impression of what church is and the church that is here is a fairly broken church. Christianity and belief are in a, in a negative light uh, in our country. Belgium is what I would call the post-Catholic country where the Catholic Church was very dominant here um, a couple decades ago, uh, but it's slowly been deteriorating. Someone said to me, um, every family over there in Europe have a family Bible. Here in Belgium most of the people don't know anything about the Bible. They have a lot of negative baggage um, or yeah uh, pre they have prejudice against the church because of the past mistakes of the institutional church here in Belgium. In fact the Catholic Church has done a, a very bad work here in our country with a lot of scandals um, and, and abuse and, and all these things. I don't say the Catholic Church is, is, a, is a horrible thing the whole, over the whole world, but this, this has so hindered the gospel here in Belgium. The church has been here so long and has such a checkered and dark history that there's so much distrust in the established church. Belgium is a country that, that needs Christ. You've got depression and suicide and family problems and all of these things. I think where it becomes kind of shocking is the level to which that's true. That, mm -hmm. uh, the level of depression here in Belgium is in the top two or three in uh, the Western world. The same with suicide rates. So you see the the, the hopelessness and the despair of Belgium and then so few Christians to give to give a witness to these people so few uh, Christian programs uh, uh, like f for teenagers or for drug addicts or for people who want to commit suicide or for people who uh, want to have abortions or people who have emotional problems or people with marriage problems 
people may turn their back to the church but I think many people are still also spiritually very very open for for spirituality and yet everything that they're looking that that people are looking at for answers are not giving them anything either and I think Europe is characterized by this sense of what do we hope in people are really starting to search and think well there must be more than than just well what is there after life and what is the purpose of life a lady down the road asked me the other day brought up in the Catholic Church, gone through Sunday school, done her communion, all those sorts of things. And she was surprised that we believed that you actually lived after you died, that there was life after death, eternal life. People uh, have a hard time um, imagining, even imagining that a, a church life could be something uh, that would really enrich their lives, personal lives or family lives. The heart of the outreach ministry is really about restoring hope to people. And it's a hope that's embedded not just into hoping for a future, but it's hoping for life right now. We probably have to do, a, do it all over again. It has to be re-evangelized. So that they can see what, what faith is, who Jesus is, what, what lives um, in our heart. This uh, video just gives you a little taste of what it's like um, to do missions in Europe, to do church and ministry in Europe. And the people in the video, we did not make the video, we've been asked that question a couple times, we're not that talented, um, are our teammates um, with Operation Mobilization, and some of them have been there for 40 years, and some of them have been there for, I don't know, five years. Uh, we're really excited to be here with you this morning. Um, we're so thankful for your support as a church and as a family, and we've always felt so loved and encouraged by you. Uh, we're so thankful um, for this opportunity to come and share a bit about who we are, where we serve, and what we're doing, but also to serve as an encouragement to you in your daily walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you that there's no more ice and no more snow. Um, I just pray um, that you would uh, speak through Joel and I this morning, and above all, that we would be able to share um, clearly about um, your work in Belgium, about where people are um, spiritually, um, and just um, what you're doing, and even though that it's a dark place, um, that you are moving and you are working. Amen. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm Lara, and this is Joel again. Um, we met at Bible College in 2007 in Australia, and our first conversation was about going into missions in Europe. And so after that conversation, my first thought was, okay, I'm going to marry him. And three years later, I did. <laughs> Um, God started speaking to me when I was 12 years old about going into um, missions into Europe. And so you could say that my entire life's goal was to be a missionary to Europe, uh, which is the only continent um, where Christianity is declining. Um, I also served um, in an orphanage in Romania for three months when I was 17, and that um, really impacted me deeply even more to become a missionary to Europe. As Wanda said, um, Joel's grandparents were missionaries in Nigeria for a long time, and so he grew up hearing about missionary stories, and so that's just what people did. They were missionaries. Um, Joel also lived in Ireland and Germany growing up, and like Wanda said, <laughs> Europe played um, a big role in his life growing up. Uh, we're in our early 30s, and we have two children, as you can see on the screen, uh, Liam and Kaylin. Uh, Liam is three and Kaylin's almost one. Uh, we joined OM Belgium in May 2013 and have been there for the past five years serving with a local church plant. Joel is serving as a short-term missions coordinator and um, I as a part of the visual arts team. We'll share more about what we're doing uh, in Belgium, but first we wanted to share and highlight some verses in 1 Thessalonians 2 that will hopefully serve as an encouragement, but also as an eye-opening view on Belgium 
um, and missions. So friends, it's obvious that our visit to you was no waste of time. We had just been given rough treatment in Philippi, as you know, but that didn't slow us down. We were sure of ourselves and God, and we went right ahead and set our peace, presenting God's message to you, defiant of the opposition. We took, we took you just as you were. We were never patronizing, never condescending, but we cared for you the way a mother cares for her children. We loved you dearly, not content to just pass on the message we wanted to give you our hearts, and we did. You remember us in those days, friends, working our fingers to the bone, up half the night moonlighting so you wouldn't have the burden of supporting us while we proclaimed God's message to you. You saw with your own eyes how discreet and courteous we were among you, with keen sensitivity to you as fellow believers. And God knows we weren't freeloaders. You experienced it all firsthand. With each of you, we were like a father with his child, holding your hand, whispering encouragement, showing you step by step how to live well before God, who called us into his own kingdom, into this delightful life. When you think of Belgium, you may not think of a mission field or a difficult place to serve or even as a scary place. Belgium isn't a closed country to the gospel and it's not illegal to be Christian, but there is opposition. The opposition we face in Belgium isn't persecution or physical harm, it's the hardened hearts of people and the distress of organized religion. In Paul's words, he sums it up when he says, we went right ahead and set our peace, defiant of the opposition. To us, this passage speaks of serving, relationships, and the difficulty of missions and ministry. Our mission is to not stop sharing Christ, even in the face of opposition. And here are some reasons why Belgium has been and is a mission field. So as many of you know, last year was the 500th anniversary of the uh, Reformation in Europe. And though it was half a millennia ago, it still holds a significant uh, impact in the country today. Um, the lasting impact of it really is that during that time, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people fled Belgium to the neighboring countries of the Netherlands, Germany, uh, and the UK. And to this day, those countries are more considered Protestant than Belgium, which is still considered a Catholic country. And Belgium is a Catholic country by, um, in the present day, more by culture than by personal faith. The Catholic Church has done and is doing a lot of good things in the country, and we partner with them. But at the same time, there is so much distrust. There is so much, um, so many things that people have just turned their back on faith because of their experience in the Catholic Church, or simply because um, they're just tired. They're just fed up with what's happening. And so for us to serve in Belgium, it's to reach people with Christ. It's not to um, make a competition about which is better, which is right. It's about to show the truth of God's gospel. So the Reformation, though it was 500 years ago, still impacts the country today. Actually, the first two people that were martyred during the Reformation were two Belgian monks who were burned at the stake. And it is now estimated that 18,000 people, Belgians, were burned at the stake during the Reformation. And one of them actually includes William Tyndale. Um, he was translating the Bible into English and distributing it for everyday people to have access to it. And 10 minutes from where we live in Brussels, there's a monument for him, celebrating his life, his work, and his death. And that serves as a real reminder for us that People in Belgium today still don't have read the Bible because they've never understood the importance of it. They never understood the significance of it. So why Belgium? It's not your typical mission field. It's not what I grew up thinking of as a mission field. Um, it's not easy to meet Belgium's practical needs. Uh, because they don't lack very much. They all have houses and nice cars. They all have health care. Um, they're fairly wealthy. Um, they have a great quality of life. But what we can meet is their desperation, their hurts, their emotional struggles, their marriage problems, the issues with their children, things that can keep them from God. 
And Christianity has a rich history. The Catholic Church obviously has played a big role in the country. Um, but even today, the opposition against Christianity is fierce. More than 50% of Belgians identify as Catholic, yet only 9% attend Mass regularly. And many of these have no personal relationship with Jesus. It is more of a cultural identity than a personal faith. Almost 40% of Belgians are atheist, agnostic, or irreligious. And this is the fastest growing demographic in Belgium. And again, there's only 1.5% evangelical believers, and this is predominantly made up of foreigners. People from other countries in Europe, or expats from North America. And on top of all of that, there's approximately 9% of Belgians are Muslim. And where we live specifically in Brussels, it's 25%. So most of our neighbors are Muslim neighbors. So in a way, it brings the mission field to Muslims to our front door. Now this is a map of Belgium, um, and it shows the dots each represent an evangelical Protestant church. The light areas have a church presence. The light blue areas neighbor a municipality that do have a church. And then the dark blue areas signify the places that don't have a church or don't neighbor a municipality with a church. And as you can see, that's a fairly significant portion of the country that doesn't have a church presence. It's actually 65%. And this is in part because of the centuries of Catholic opposition to Protestantism and evangelical but more op recently as an opposition to the hardened hearts from Belgians to matters of faith. Like I said, they have such a high quality of life that it's hard for them to understand that they need something else, that they need a relationship with Jesus, that they could benefit from reading God's word. So for us, serving in Belgium is more often than not discouraging, exhausting, stressful, I mean, we've been asked this question on home assignment now. How are we encouraged um, in our ministry? And to be honest, the answer is, it's difficult. There's not many opportunities where you can feel, hey, we're making a difference. We can see this difference in people's lives. And the victories that we experience are more of a breakthrough in a relationship. Maybe it's a good conversation about God in our English classes or simply just being able to find out why Belgians are so opposed to church in matters of faith. You rarely see mass conversions in Belgium. You rarely see conversions in general in Belgium. And so for us, we find the joy and our encouragement through the small victories. We rely on the Holy Spirit to be working in the people's lives that we share our life with. When we share about God to them, we trust that God is active in their lives and that um, the Holy Spirit will, will transform their lives and they will have a personal relationship with Jesus one day. So our goal is to live out the statement, don't stop sharing Christ in our neighborhood of Brussels every day through relational ministry. And relational ministry is simply, we support the local church, we and the local church reach people around us with the gospel, and then these new believers reach even more people around them. And this is an important aspect of relational ministry because there's not many missionaries in Belgium, there's very few churches in Belgium, and there's very few people who are willing to share their faith with others out of fear of how they will be looked at or perceived. And so it's important that we live in the same community where we serve. So we serve in the northern part of Brussels. We live amongst regular everyday people. And that provides us with an opportunity to share God in our everyday lives, as well as in our ministry. And the way we view missions is love the people, serve the people, and share with people. And we do that through the local church plant that we've partnered with for the past five years called Look Atalpa. And we have been responsible for encouraging, supporting the church leaders in practical, emotional, and spiritual ways. The average size of a Belgian church is 20, 25 people. It's generally older, and more people are leaving the church than joining the church. So our role is to help with children's ministry, 
music ministry, setting up for uh, church on a Sunday morning, organizing special events. Basically, we're there to model what serving God looks like in the church. In the Belgian church, it's really difficult to find people who just want to do something as simple as make coffee on a Sunday morning or set up for church, not to mention singing or playing an instrument or reading the Bible passage. So we're there to model serving. And we also mentor and disciple some of the young people in the church to enable them to grow in their faith and for them to be um, equipped to share their faith with others. And this is an important aspect because a lot of the Christians in Belgium are under the age of 40. So they are more active in their careers and in school. They're more active um, in the social life. And so for them to be um, able to share their faith, it, it's just an opportunity for them to reach so many more people for Christ than what an individual church could do or even us as missionaries. And so for us, it's difficult because for many generations now, the church in Belgium has been dying a slow death. It is no longer a community that serves the people and shares the good news of Jesus. It is more focused on surviving. It is more inwardly focused because it's a small church community. The finances are a problem. Programs are a problem. And so instead of reaching people in their communities for Christ, they turn inwards to focus on surviving to sustain themselves, that they can still meet on Sunday mornings. And one way that Lukatalpa really tries to engage the community and to reach people for the gospel and to invite them to church is through English classes. Part of the church has a community center that during the week we offer classes for everyday people in the neighborhood. There's English classes, guitar, drawing classes, and baking classes. And the whole purpose is that we can provide a service to them, that they can come to know Christ, and that we can build relationships with them. And one of those students in my English class, her name is Nabila. She has been a student at Catalpa now for four years. Um, when she joined, she wasn't, um, she wasn't a believer, but she was open. She was interested. And last year she attended our Easter service and has since become more open about her faith. And just recently she became a believer. And now um, she is considering open, opening her home to host Bible study. So for us, that's why we, we like to serve in this way, relationally. Because we can see people from the moment they attend a class for the first time to sometimes the moment they accept Jesus. And that, to us, is the most exciting thing. And this is God at work. This is God at work using relationships that are forged through time, prayer, and sharing in each other's joys and service, joys and sorrows. Food is really important in Belgium, like most countries. Um, and I taught um, an American baking class uh, last year because I'm American. Um, and so my first student was uh, Francoise. She was a middle-aged woman, um, and uh, she's very kind and very caring. She was open to hear about God and church and why I was in Belgium, so it was really easy to um, build that relationship, that foundation with her, um, to start talking about the Lord. Um, we've been able to connect in a lot of different areas in life, like motherhood and baking and also Scrabble. Um, and... Uh, she has come to a few of the major events that um, the community center has hosted and brought her husband. And when students bring their family members, we get really excited because they are seeing that um, in the community center, they're loved, that it's a family, and then they want to bring their family into the community center to share in part of the relationships. One area that we have seen um, God work and are really excited about um, is through the relationships we've built through youth ministry. Um, 
um, we have mentored and discipled and challenged them to live out their faith in a country that doesn't care for God. Um, when we arrived five years ago, there were about five students from the age of 13 to maybe 22. Um, and through the last five years, we have seen them grow in their faith. And they have, um, two of them got married to each other. And then they started um, uh, overseeing the children's ministry in our church and taking other responsibilities in our church. And um, two other ones have started leading and volunteering at a local youth group. And so to see them really step up into leadership roles, not just attending, has been really encouraging to us. Um, and for them, going to school, they're the only Christians they know. Going to work, they're the only Christians they know. Even going out with a group of friends a lot of times, they're the only Christians there. So um, it's been such an honor for us to become friends with them, but also just to show them what it's like to live your daily walk with God in an area where no one understands and they don't receive support outside of their church. Uh, OM Belgium uses visual arts, um, dance, music, and drama as tools to evangelize. The arts brings Belgians together and presents the gospel in an easy way to understand um, one example of this is um, a recent art exhibition in a small town in Jean Bleu, Belgium. I painted an image of Jesus' eyes based on the passage from John 18, 28 through 41, called Rejection. One little girl who attended um, the exhibition really enjoyed my painting. And this is our heart, is to reach people and connect them with God in ways um, that touch their heart, in ways that they can connect with. Arts are only the medium we use to evangelize. We rely on the Holy Spirit to reveal himself through the art that we create, and through that, we can see lives transformed for him. Um, some of the ladies in this picture were born and raised um, in Belgium uh, and for years without having access to a family Bible because um, the, uh, Bible, the Bible was illegal in Belgium until the 1960s. And that has had a profound impact on Belgians' interest in the Bible uh, because generations have grown up without one. Christiane, the older lady in the picture with the dark hair, uh, started coming to um, the Bible study that I attended in 2014. Um, she has grown up in the church all her life, but la lacked a basic knowledge of the Bible, prayer, and an understanding of grace and forgiveness. She couldn't find books of the Bible, didn't understand how chapters and verses worked, and had no knowledge of many of the basic New Testament stories that we might all take for granted learning in uh, Sunday school growing up. Now she has an understanding of the love of God, what Christian fellowship is, and she has a confidence in the Lord. She lives six houses down on the same street as the church and community center. Having a presence in the neighborhood can have a profound impact on people's lives. Years of prayer for her has seen her become a member of the church, been baptized, and is a regular attendee of the Bible study who now has a personal relationship with Jesus and a knowledge of his word. And part of my role with Operation Mobilization is uh, I'm the short-term missions coordinator for OM Belgium. And what that means is I'm passionate about recruiting short-term volunteers to come to serve in a country like Belgium where they don't see it, they may not see it as a mission field. But once they come, they can experience um, what life is like in Belgium, how they can serve, and how that impacts people around them. And one of the new things that we've started in the last year is a program called Factor. Um, it's basically an opportunity for people aged 16 to 35 to come for three months to serve practically in our hospitality center, but also just to rub shoulders with our team. Our team is very international, and they're all dedicated long-term missionaries. And it's to uh, allow them to experience world missions. Um, in January to March, we had uh, three young women, one from Australia, one from Ukraine, and one from France. And currently we have a, a young man from Australia and two young women from the US and Ireland. 
And this is really exciting for us because we serve in Belgium, but we want to support and encourage the local church and not do ministry and missions for them. In the same way that we want people to come for short-term missions through Factor is for the same reason. We want to expose them to the need in Belgium so that maybe one day that they can pursue their calling that God's put on their heart to join missions, whether that's locally where they live, in Belgium, or elsewhere. And it's very encouraging for us to see people with this passion to serve. If you would like more information about volunteering or coming on a short-term mission trip or Factor, please see us after the service. I'd be very uh, excited to share that with you. But in closing, don't stop sharing Christ. It's, it's one of those things that sounds cliche and it sounds very obvious that when you live your life, you want to be sharing about who God is through your words and through your actions. But in a country like Belgium, it's really difficult because in living the Christian life, people reject you. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to keep on doing what you're already doing, whether anyone pays attention or not. Our Christian lives and ministry are all about perseverance. A little example can have a big influence, and that is our hope in Belgium. And in closing, one quick story. One example of that is a woman named Clarice. She's a new believer, and she started coming to church three years ago. And now her husband, her two kids, and her sister and her kids all come to church. They've all uh, accepted Jesus, and now they're all active in the church. Clarice leads a Sunday school for the kids once a month and hosts a bi-weekly Bible study that I attend in her home. And that is exactly what we want to see. That is why we're serving in Belgium, because we want to see people take the faith that maybe they know in their heads, but not their hearts, and make it real. Don't Stop Sharing Christ is a daunting challenge for all believers because of the opposition we face and the climate we live in, but that isn't a reason to stop. That is the reason to continue. And we are hoping to continue. We're currently on home assignment um, to raise prayer and financial support, to visit all the churches and supporters that we have. Um, And we really want to take this time to really share about why Belgium's a mission field, why we're serving there, why we feel God's called us there. And we'd really like to um, answer any questions that you may have. We'd really like to um, partner with you in prayer and financially. So if you're interested in that, please come up to the table um, in the cafe after the service and talk to us. But in closing, I want to leave you with this. We should be challenged by Paul's words in verse 2, where he says, We were sure of ourselves in God and went right ahead and set our peace, presenting God's message to you, defiant of the opposition. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning where we can come, worship you, fellowship together, learn more about your word and be encouraged. Lord, I thank you that we each have the opportunity to not stop sharing Christ wherever we are in our day-to-day lives, with our colleagues, with our kids, with our um, fellow students. Lord, I just pray that that passion that we have can also be spread throughout the world, that people can come to know who you are. And Lord, I pray specifically for Belgium, Lord, for the amount of people who have just completely turned their back on you. Lord, I pray that you soften hearts that people will come to know you, that there will be a revival in the country. And I pray that you can really help raise up people to pray, give, and go to serve in missions. Amen.